So this playlist is going to be an introduction to assignment one, but I wanted to, to touch base on exercise two at the very beginning. We finished submitting it as a flat shape. If you want to, you can turn it into what's called flat 2.0 in the design world. This was something that was popularized in like the 2010s. And it's just giving a little bit more dimension by choosing certain uh, tones and variations. So the, bon the bonus finishing extra is to use the layer styles that go with each of your shape layers. You still keep them as vectors, but you double click them and then choose different layer styles and play with them. Things like drop shadows, things like outer glow, inner shadow. And what that does, I'll just show it really quickly here. If you double click on the layer, you get to your layer styles. These affect your vector. So I can put an inner shadow on this and then play with these settings. You have to play with them pretty strongly to kind of see them. And then you can walk them back or change the angle. But I can have kind of this soot coming in and I can really grow it all around. Just make the guy look a little bit more depressed. And I can play with the opacity of it, and that's just one, right? And I can play with the blending mode of it. So you have a lot of power there. And this is how we'll do a lot of customizations to vectors throughout the class. When we do logo design, that's how we'll color them, add effects. When we do type design, it's how we'll color them and add effects. So something to keep in mind, I'll also just really show you drop shadow quickly. I'll just take this one, for instance, double click it, add a drop shadow, which goes outside of the, the edges of it. Give a little bit of noise, size, right? And then that will kind of blend everything together and give a light source. You can also do kind of a, an inner glow, like on the spine of the book. I can brighten it a little bit at its edge. Like so, I'll take the noise down. Just so it's kind of glowing at the, at the edge there on and on. So lots of things that you can do. And then what's so nice about them is you can turn them off in the same way that you can turn them on. And they're just options for you within each vector. And if you ever want to edit them, you just double click them. And you can make them more subtle. Like so. All right. But that is that is optional and added. Now we are moving on Let's go to the home page, and we're moving on to our first assignment. Assignments are different than exercises because assignments are worth three points, not two points. And you'll see in our course outline the assignment rubric. You'll also see it within the, uh, the assignment itself. So as soon as we start assignments, we have this general assignment grading rubric. So this is the main thing to understand. On assignments... Turning in nothing and failing to do the assignment by the deadline means you get a zero. And if you get a zero, you cannot resubmit it later. Right? That means it's just a lost opportunity. Now, the good news is the class is worth 100 points. Each assignment is worth three points. So that means you lose three out of 100 points and you can't get them back. You can come back from that. Right? What you can't come back from professionally is missing acknowledging a deadline. So this is just getting you used to that. So what do you do instead? If you're sick, if you didn't um, have finished work to turn in by the deadline that's in the course outline and in Canvas, you want to turn in something, even if it doesn't meet the requirements of the assignment, right? So it, for instance, with the exercise two, if you just submitted your name in the band book title, it was posted to the canvas before the deadline, right? And that would be enough to acknowledge the deadline. It shows me you know that you're supposed to be working on this assignment. I'm going to require something for you in the assignment. One, that's there's usually more than one component required, right? 
And so we're going to be doing a sketch. Maybe the only thing you get posted by the deadline for assignment one is the sketch. doesn't meet all the requirements, but that will get you a one. And as long as you get a one or higher, you know, you've turned something in by the deadline, then you can resubmit it later for full points, right? And also for an improved portfolio project, which is the whole point. So we're going to start assignment one today. We're going to be working on it next class, and then it's going to be due on February 5th, which sounds like a long time away, but it's really only one and a half class periods, you know, from now. Yeah, the weekend's in there. And you can always work on these outside of class, but I try to demonstrate that they can be done just within the class time if you're using your time effectively, right? So I'm going to go to unit modules. This is unit four. This is our first assignment that uses compositing. And what we're going to composite first is in many ways the most forgiving thing to composite, and that is a background setting. The reason landscapes, background settings are forgiving is when you're blending them together, you can always soften edges and it will just look like it's further in the distance, right? After this, assignment two, we're going to be compositing our own creature design. That's less forgiving because you can't just like hide things in atmosphere when it's a full figured creature. So I call this the fantasy landscape composite. Fantasy just means it has to come from your own brain and it can follow any kind of laws or physics you want, right? Like any kind of world that Doctor Who could visit, right? You can make. But it needs to be built from pixels that you find or from photos that you take yourself. And those pixels need to be high enough resolution. So the first part of this component, this is going to inform a discussion we have. And this is, it says due by tonight. I usually make these due midnight the night they're introduced, but you have longer to do them and get credit. I just want everyone to know that they're there, right? Everyone should see this because this will inform a, um, a discussion we have in class at the end of assignment one. It's what are the advantages and disadvantages of digital raster art over traditional art? What is raster? That means that it's pixel based. Okay. These are other words for it. What is traditional art? Things that don't use the computer, right? Painting, sculpture, drawing. So here we have an example of a digital composite landscape. It's not particularly a good one, but it's, it's there, right? It has like a face in the tree. That's not particularly well done. It's got like a figure in this tree. Not particularly well done, but it's an idea, right? And this isn't my work and it's not student work, so I'm not ragging on anyone. It's just one that was on Pixabay. Right? And then here's another one that was on Pixabay. And this is a scan of traditional artwork, and it's done with, with ink and watercolors on rice paper, right? They're both fantasy landscapes by which you can, you couldn't find this landscape anywhere in reality and photograph it. Instead, they're kind of built from different collections of idealized forms. So to get credit for your questions of the day, you're asked to write a response with your name and then more than 100 words that it addresses the, the question, right? And you can do them written by hand if you prefer not to type this kind of thing, but you need to attach a photo of your, your handwritten response. Right? Or you can copy and paste it from a word processor. And that's it. And it's worth one point. So be aware of it today. If you want to get it started, you can always flesh it out later. And that will help inform what we're learning. Okay, these are the past instructor and student examples. We start with a sketch, preferably both a vertical format landscape sketch and a horizontal format landscape sketch. This is what you're required to have at the beginning of next class. It can be a bad sketch. We'll be talking about how to improve it at the beginning of class. But we're going to talk about the things you want to start thinking about to make your sketch. Basically, before you sketch, you have to kind of know what kind of fantasy setting you want. Do you want it to be like a desert? Do you want it to be in the middle of the day? Do you want it to be like Arctic ice? Do you want it to be floating in space with nebulas like filling the sky? Do you want it to be an apocalyptic 
you know, cityscape after a nuclear bomb. We have an example of this one printed out up there. I can pass it around next class because you're really working on the the details of blending everything together. This one uses pixels from video game wallpapers, right? And then composites them together. So the one thing you're not allowed to have in a concept design for setting is figurative content. Figurative content is stuff that we would expect to move, right? So figurative content includes people, animals, working vehicles, fire, <laughs> right? Anything we would expect to move. Uh, bodies of water that are moving, like waterfalls, you want to avoid for this, even though some students have used them, but then they have to animate them later. Because what we're going to do is create creatures, and then we're going to have the option of animating creatures on top of these settings. So you don't want to have a creature animated and then have like a, a frozen waterfall behind it or frozen flames. You know, it takes away the illusion. So these are all static elements. This is figurative sculpture, right? There are broken down vehicles. These are not things we expect to move. So just like we, we did the exercise one, introduction to compositing, and we found line art, we want to find good, high quality reference materials, at least a thousand pixels in the smallest dimension using Google image search or Pixabay. Pixabay is wonderful for this because there's so many landscape photographs on Pixabay. We can also find images from places like NASA. Everything NASA makes is a public domain image because it's paid for with tax, tax money. So anything from the Hubble telescope, anything from the James Webb telescope, even this digital art that was created by a NASA employee for NASA of a view from a moon of Saturn is available for you to use, right? Why does it need to be at least a thousand pixels in the smallest dimension? It means when you view it full screen, it's going to more than fill your screen. That makes it print quality at around eight by 10. Okay, Pixabay is a wonderful resource for this, but you need to have inspiration first. And this is why you get the, some time before you need to sketch and bring it in next class. I find a lot of inspiration from uh, cartoon landscapes. Because cartoon landscapes, they have to have animated figures that go on top of them. And they also have to set a scene very quickly. So a good landscape design, setting design, whether it's for a video game, whether it's for animation, whether it's for comic books, uh, has three distinct layers of depth. And we don't always get that in our daily life. Three distinct layers of depth means there's something in the immediate foreground, something in the middle ground, and something in the far background. We'll do a little exercise to help us understand this better next class. So here you have this grass in the immediate foreground. You have this beanstalk in the middle ground, and then you have this cloud in the far background. And these are focused on different parts of that, but all of them have those three layers of depth. Similarly, we want our sketch to have something in the immediate foreground, in the middle ground, and in the far background. And then we're going to take the sketch that you bring in next class, and it's going to be informed by some of the references you find. I'll show you that in a second. And we're going to use it as kind of a puzzle map for placing on our pixels and then cleaning them up into our own fantasy landscape. What this is not is a sticker sheet project where you just find one really big landscape and then put lots of extra planets on it, right? Because then that's not creating the landscape yourself. So that's why the sketch is so important to show how you're deciding the composition of the major components. And that's what also makes it transformed into your own artwork instead of derivative based on what you find. So I'm starting with some inspiration. I used a combination of generative, you know, AI art programs and then compositing to make this image because I want this kind of spooky, surreal, um, kind of Stone Age image landscape with some weird colors. So then I'm also looking at some Thomas Grieve 19th century set design. It's someone I'm really into right now. You can see some of their work in the McNay Theater Collection, but they're watercolors for operas. 
and then these get turned into big backdrops for the, for the opera. But this was one for a grotto scene in an opera. So it's like an interior cave. I think that's pretty cool.